war can be devastating. The environmental infrastructure that sustains humanity has been a target and an instrument of war for centuries, from Napoleon's occupation and subsequent burning of Moscow in 1812 to the atrocities committed by the retreating enemy combatants in World War I and World War II, and even as recently as 2022 by the Russian army destroying critical infrastructure in Ukraine. Scorched Earth tactics aim to destroy anything useful to the enemy, including food and agriculture, water sources, tactical elements, and sometimes even people. A devastating example of this was in 1991, where retreating Iraqi forces used scorched earth tactics when withdrawing from Kuwait. As the Iraqi army withdraws from Kuwait, they left over 700 oil wells burning, with crude oil spilling across the desert and into the Persian Gulf. A layer of soot and oil fell out of the sky and mixed with the sand and gravel, which formed a layer of tar across almost 5% of Kuwait's landscape. The fires burned for 10 months, and when the last one was finally extinguished in November 1991, the environmental impact was clear. For a comparison of how devastating this event was, let's look at the 2010 Deepwater Horizon spill into the Gulf of Mexico. On the night of April 20th, 2010, a surge of natural gas blasted through a concrete core traveling up the length of the deepwater rig and exploding on the platform. This caused up to 60,000 barrels of crude oil a day to discharge into the Gulf of Mexico, creating the largest marine oil spill in history. To better visualize this, let's imagine this barrel represents 1 million barrels of oil. The deepwater oil spill was estimated to have released nearly 5 million barrels of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. Following the Kuwaiti oil disaster, an estimated 1.5 billion barrels of oil was released into the environment. But let's rewind to understand how we got here. In 1990, tensions begin to flare between Iraq and Kuwait. Iraq alleges Kuwaiti drilling in the Rumaila oil fields located within Iraq's territory. Iraq's dispute with Kuwait over this region has its roots in Britain's decision in 1899 to establish Kuwait as a British protectorate. Although the Kuwaiti royal family had ruled the area since 1756, Iraq still considered the region as part of its southern province. After the Arab League of Nations established the Kuwait-Iraqi border, two miles north of the southern tip of the oil field, Kuwait erected its own oil rigs on its own territory and drilled into the rich pools below. Furthermore, Iraq claimed that Kuwait had been producing oil above treaty limits established by the 13 nations of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or as you might know them better as, OPEC. By the eve of the Iraqi invasion, Kuwait had set production quotas to almost 1.9 million barrels per day, which coincided with a sharp drop in global oil prices. For a country with a relatively large investment income, compared to its Middle Eastern neighbors, Kuwait favored relatively low oil prices. However, this move left Kuwait isolated within the cartel, as the remaining 12 OPEC countries relied heavily on oil exports to sustain their economies. These two factors gave Iraq a clear motive to slow Kuwait's oil production capacity, and as a result, on the 17th of January 1991, the Iraqi army began the invasion and subsequent occupation of Kuwait, which we know today as the beginnings of the First Gulf War. Iraq quickly adopted a scorched earth policy. 800 Kuwaiti oil fields were rigged with C4 plastic explosives and detonated. Thick black smoke, including toxic fumes, poured from the hellish infernos of the wellhead fires. Of these, nearly 700 oil wells were left burning as the earth was scorched and the remaining oil wells gushed oil, forming sticky black lakes. These oil lakes ranged from a few inches to four feet in depth and up to seven miles long. By striking the wells, Iraq could begin to immediately terminate oil production and drain Kuwait's economic base. In addition to the wells, Iraqi forces also destroyed almost every other aspect of Kuwait's oil production, including gathering centers, transfer facilities, and even operation centers. A recently unclassified document from the US military shows the unparalleled extent of the devastation. How do we handle? Avoid. How fast can we handle? We can't. What are the requirements? Beyond military capability. Iraq's sabotage crippled nearly all of Kuwait's oil production, damaging or destroying approximately 85% of Kuwait's oil wells in virtually every major oil field. A blanket of dense smoke and petroleum mist lay over most of Kuwait. At high noon, people often had to use flashlights to see street curbs. The blazing wellheads generated a smoke plume which reached at least 22,000 feet into the atmosphere and initially stretched over 800 miles as day turned to night, 
blackening the skies over the region. Three million barrels of oil burnt daily for almost a year, leading to vast quantities of soot, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and nitric oxide escaping into the surrounding atmosphere. The Kuwaiti oil minister estimated between 25 and 50 million barrels of unburnt oil from damaged facilities pooled together to create around 300 oil lakes. These pools contaminated around 40 million tons of sand and earth. The mixture of desert sand, unignited oil, and soot generated by the burning of these oil wells formed a layer of hard tarcrete which covered nearly 5% of Kuwait's landmass. The oil lakes threatened underground fresh water supply and had a devastating impact on local wildlife. As the poisonous smoke, soot, and ash filled the skies, a team of international firefighters was formed. They comprised of more than 16,000 workers from 38 countries, importing over 200,000 tons of equipment to fight the flames. The teams used never-before-tested technologies to put out the fires. This international response was dubbed al auda meaning the return. Highly trained specialists cleared areas of unexploded munitions. Everything from mines and bombs to grenades and artillery shells had to be cleared. With the resources at hand, the team constructed reservoir systems consisting of 200 lagoons, each filled with a million gallons of seawater and 90 miles of pipeline to deliver water to the frontline firefighting efforts. Shielded by sections of corrugated steel, the teams used explosives, mud-like well sealant, and even a jet engine mounted on a military tank to extinguish the fires. One by one, the fires went out and the blowouts were brought under control. The Al Ada operation, which began on the 11th of March 1991, continued for 220 days at a cost of about 1.5 billion US dollars. After all the heroic efforts from the firefighters and the international crew of laborers and engineers, the last well was finally capped on the 6th of November 1991, bringing an end to the blazing infernos. <laughs>